Between 1857 and 1996, more than 150,000 First Nation, Métis, and Inuit children were sent by the Canadian government to special institutions called Indian Residential Schools. 130 schools were built and operated by the government of Canada, and the country's mainline churches, the Catholic, Anglican, Methodist, Presbyterian, and United Churches. Beginning in the mid-1990s, thousands of former students sued the churches that ran residential schools and the federal government that funded them. They sought compensation for the loss of language and culture, as well as the abuse suffered in these schools. This led to larger civil suits that were resolved in 2005 with the negotiation of the largest class action settlement in Canadian history, the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement. Since then, the number of abuse claimants has been nearly double the original estimate. In 1925, the newly formed United Church of Canada assumed responsibility for 12 residential schools in places like Port Alberni, British Columbia, Brandon, Manitoba, and Round Lake, Saskatchewan. The total number of residential schools in Canada peaked at 80 in 1931. By 1945, there were more than 9,000 students in residential schools, about half the Aboriginal student population. In schools close to and on reserves, or those much farther away, the students' time was divided. One part of their day was spent attending classes, the other learning farming and trades. This policy of aggressive assimilation removed many children from their families and communities for 10 months out of the year. Within a few generations, native languages and traditions diminished or were wiped out altogether as students were forced to speak, dress, think, and act like non-Aboriginal Canadians. At residential schools, many students lived in substandard conditions and were punished, sometimes harshly, for violating a rigid code of conduct. Many recall the rough cutting of their braids and dousing for lice, as well as the forced removal of their clothing. In the most extreme cases, they endured sexual abuse at the hands of dormitory supervisors, educators, and administrators. It wasn't until the early 1980s that the extent of physical and sexual abuse became apparent. By the early 1990s, the legacy of residential schools was a well-established fact. In 1998, the United Church formally apologized for its role in the residential school system. At the time, the Church was a co-defendant in a landmark court case involving the former Alberni Indian Residential School on Vancouver Island. It had been 30 years since the United Church closed its last residential school, and just two years since the system shut down for good. An estimated 80,000 former students are still living today. Of those, nearly 7% attended United Church-run schools. Many of their children and grandchildren now lag behind in formal education, just as they once did. It's said that a third of all Aboriginals have less than high school education. One result is that the unemployment rate for Aboriginals between 25 and 64 remains almost twice the rate for non-Aboriginals, roughly 13%. On reserves, as much as 25% remain unemployed. But it's the trauma, neglect, and humiliation that survivors experienced that greatly contributed to many social problems in Aboriginal communities today. Rates of post-traumatic stress disorder, drug abuse, alcoholism, and incarceration are higher among Aboriginals than other parts of the population. And in a tragic twist, those who suffered abuse and dislocation in residential schools are prone to perpetuating family and community dysfunction in the future.